This is Debbie Dashinger inviting you to join me and some amazing presenters aboard the Galactic Origin Celebrity Cruise to the Yucatan in December. Go to D-E-B-B-I, D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash cruise. Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashinger, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to yet another installment of Dare to Dream. And today I'm going to be speaking with Sean Clayton. Sean overcame abuse, suicide attempts, and federal prison. Sean discovered the power of self-love through adversity. And today he integrates ancient wisdom with modern healing techniques, guiding seekers like you and me to unlock their potential and create lives of true abundance. This show, Dare to Dream, has been around for 17 and a half years. It won three Talk Radio Positive Change Awards, the COVR Award for Best Podcast Show, Welp Magazine named Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger, one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year, and it is high ranking on Apple Podcasts. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. If you would like to do energy work in the world, or become a facilitator, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R dot com. If you'd like to know what your galactic ancestry is, I invite you, and hey, you don't even have to swipe your cheek to find out. You can unlock your cosmic potential. I am offering you a free starseed breakdown video and report where you can explore 19 different types of starseeds. It's captivating. Find out what your galactic origins are, and don't miss this chance to connect with your star lineage. Where are you from and why? Go to debbie-inger.com slash starseed. That's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash starseed. Well, I'm speaking in yet another very exciting place I want to invite you to. I love that I'm ending this year speaking on a galactic cruise. What a way to end the year going to the Yucatan. And then I'm starting, literally starting the new year, speaking at the Sedona Channel Panel, obviously in Sedona, Arizona for 2025 January. This is going to be so transformative. All of these panels, workshops, and keynotes from renowned channelers like Daryl Anka, who channels Bashar, Wendy Kennedy, Jamie Price, Lisa Royal Holt, Rob Gauthier, and much more. It's going to be held at the Sedona Performing Arts Center. And this is such a beautiful opportunity to connect with like-minded individuals and gain profound insights. So secure your spot. Come hear me speak at my 90-minute workshop and go to debbie-inger.com slash Sedona, D-E-B-B-I, D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash Sedona. And then further on in the 2025 year is going to be the 23rd annual Los Angeles Conscious Life Expo. Like, this is the event you don't want to miss. My favorite thing all year. And I'm very excited because my guest today is also one of the presenters, and I am going to have in the show notes the way to get tickets. And also, if you're curious in advance how you can hear Sean and I speak and the many other phenomenal people in our industry that you already know and love, you can go to debbie-inger.com slash C-L-E for Conscious Life Expo, debbie-inger.com slash C. L E. And again, that will be in the description. So who is this marvelous guy that I'm speaking to today and excited to get to know better? It is Sean Clayton. He's a transformational coach. He's a radical optimist whose life journey overcoming childhood abuse, health challenges, and deep personal struggles, has forged his path as a guide to personal liberation and empowerment. With a unique approach that blends ancient wisdom and modern tools, Sean inspires others to read the code, 
of their experiences, turning trauma into triumph and fueling growth through everyday life. He is dedicated to helping others unlock the science of abundance and live an integrated journey of self-awareness and world engagement. To learn more, go to scienceofabundance.ai. That is Sean's website. And with that, I welcome Sean Clayton to Dare to Dream. It's really great to have you here today. Hey, Debbie, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. An honored and beautiful introduction. Thank you again. Pleasure. You have an unbelievable background that I find really fascinating and, and you have so much to teach. So I'd love to start with this adversity that you got through because one of these is a lot to have so many of those would drown most people. Can you talk a little bit so folks have an overview of how you ended up and found yourself in federal prison and what that was like? Oh, we went right to it. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Um, Well, first I want to start and say, because a lot of, a lot of what happens in trauma work, and I don't, I'm not a trauma facilitator or anything along those lines, but a lot of what happens in trauma work, we do a lot of trauma dumping and we repeat the cycles. So one of the quickest reframes that I can do is help individuals understand that everything I'm going to talk about is a gift. Everything that I gave myself through all of these different experiences that most individuals would say are traumatic were gifts that I gave myself from the moment now. So I'll talk a little bit about the incarceration times, but it really actually started, you know, from the moment that I was, and I, you know, and and Debbie, I appreciate you mentioning the abuse, but it was, you know, childhood sexual abuse. And it was nobody from my immediate family. I always have to uh, clear that up because oftentimes people will go to my parents and be like, did you do this? And they're like, no. So I want to make sure that that's framed really quickly. Um, but it started all the way from the moment that, um, you know, nine years old, between nine and 14, I was sexually abused. And that was the moment that you lose that aspect of innocence. And most of us, when we're children, you know, I always say children are closest to God because they have that divine channel that's inherent in them. And then we as parents oftentimes, you know, mess them up. We give them our trauma, pass it along to them. And then those cycles start to perpetuate and repeat themselves. And so for me, this moment that I jumped through where it was like, okay, you have to challenge yourself, right? If I'm looking at writing the Akashic records of the book of my life with this very specific opportunity that somebody violated something innocent in me. Then at which point you get out of that moment in time. And then all of a sudden you start to see the world much differently. You don't have the same innocence. You start to observe the reality of your parents and what they're going through. You know, my father had infidelity issues, right? My mother started drinking a lot. Um, You start to see all of this destruction in your family take place. And then you start walking down this path of saying, okay, well, how do I get validated in my life? Where do I look at? Where do I need, who do I need to go to? And you do things in life where school starts to become extremely important. And you say, okay, well, if I can get validated through my good grades, I'll do that. If I can get validated through sports, I can do that. And as a black African-American individual, of course, you know, there's some athletic gifts inside that I had. So I started to expose those out and became really good at sports and really good at school and use that concept of affirmation in order to get feedback from the illusion that we create in our life in order to then feel better about myself. Well, now, if you take that and you expand it out and you keep doing that over and over and over again in life, well, then all of a sudden you end up in the workforce, you end up working with a very specific family member who I was extremely close to, um, actually a godfather of mine. And we got close into business. And this guy, you know, lived next to Deion Sanders, had the most amazing house, you know, 20,000 square foot deal. And I'm like, okay, I want to be like this guy. This guy's giving me affirmation. And he's telling me from a career perspective, I'm doing a good job. So I partnered with him, built out a medical staffing business, staffing business did extremely well, grew it to, you know, a 10 plus million dollar company. And immediately, um, some of the things that happened with him is he started to take that money and he disappeared. And um, it was it was a, a the, the concept of it. It's around like debt financing. And um, back then, at that moment in time, it's like in 2008, they're just the banking system wasn't as tight. And so he ended up um, walking away with 16 million dollars. I ended up taking the hit for that because I own the majority of the company. I didn't realize what he was doing, but then at which point the federal government comes not comes knocking on my door 
and I take the hit for it. Um, I had some family members working for me inside of the company that I was very guarded for. And, you know, when the federal government comes and says, hey, you did something wrong, the opportunity to fight to fight them really isn't there. You know, like it's like you against the United States of America. <laughs> so so it was either plea out, you fight them or you become an informant. But there was nothing to inform because it wasn't like I had some like crazy case to get involved with. So I took the plea. It was a 46 month sentence. And it was actually one of the most transformative experiences of my life. Because what I ended up recognizing is that, you know, there wasn't anybody in prison that was going to affirm you, right? And if you did get affirmed in there, there were going to be some really interesting paths to become a better criminal because you want to get closer with people that, you know, are like doing like ill will type of things, or you end up going within and understanding a lot more about yourself. So in that environment, two things that I learned. One was that I needed to learn to love myself in the, in the opportunity where nobody was going to really love you. And in that, I started to recognize that you start to love others as a reflection of you. So being somebody that, you know, when I grew up, I wasn't black enough, right? Because the way that I talked in the environment that I was in, I wasn't white enough because of the color of my skin, right? Of course, I'm not Hispanic. And in prison, it's one of the most segregated environments that you could ever be in. So if you imagine that this environment is wildly segregated, and I don't really fit in any of these molds, well, I have to just really actually love me so much that in that process of loving myself, it opened what I would consider this fractal that led me down the path of becoming more spiritual. Now, did I, be, I become spiritual in prison? No, I really read the Bible. I, you know, I, you, you kind of take what you can get because there wasn't anybody to learn from, but it did open the door to take a different path in life than going backward and repeating the same cycles that I had before I went in. And so it was less about looking at the illusion to get more aff affirmation. It was more figuring out what was inside of me. And then after I got out over the next, I got out at 33 years old, over the next seven or eight years, that was when I went on this really deep healing journey from getting wildly sick with a thyroid disease, um, you know, really shattering aspects of my own personal family that I had. Uh, and then at which point I learned some really deep knowledge that allowed me to start seeing the matrix and the code and going down a very specific path that we, um, if you follow me, then you'll understand that, but then we'll probably get into in this conversation as well. We definitely will. And I have two questions based on what you just said. My first, and then we can close out the prison thing, but <laughs> for somebody, I mean, that's a long time to be yeah. in a prison, mm -hmm. right? How, it's almost two years. How did you protect yourself? How did you learn? Because that isn't your background. How did you learn how to protect yourself? Well, what it was less about self-protection because, you know, what, what you'll find is when you go in there is that nobody wants to make their sentence longer. Okay. Um, when you, when you first go in, you get in an environment where it is pretty violent and you start to experience a much different kind of world, the stuff that you see on television, when you get deeper into it and you actually go to what it's considered home. Right. And I was in a camp, so it wasn't anything that was like wildly different, but you did lose your freedoms. Everybody in there is on their way out. They're looking for a path to actually change their lives. And even though they have some hardened aspects of themselves, you know, people in there for 25 or 30 years, um, individuals that, you know, it's very, it's not a whole lot of violence um, once you get into that space, but it is intimidating. And so the intimidation is what most people try to protect themselves from. So they click up and they find gangs and they get involved in these little groups so that they can eat well and do well and feel safe. Um, but for me, it was just, you know, knowing myself, actually learning, learning who I was and being still enough in respect of all of that got me to that path, um, honoring my intelligence, not trying to make myself dumber so that I can actually fit in one group or another. And in doing that, my light started to shine and people started to really surround themselves with me. And I found different things that I could do inside of that environment that created value so that when people saw me, they were like, oh, okay, this is somebody that I want to talk to. So whether it was, hey, what do I do when I get out? And I help people with their plans, right? Um, I learned how to cook in a microwave really well. <laughs> so um, those were some things that added value. Um, you know, there, there were little things like that that I would get involved with and just, you know, took care of myself and my health. And when people saw you show up that way, they just honored and respected you much differently than if you were looking to somebody else for affirmation. And so that was one of the biggest lessons that I learned in that space. And that makes me very happy to hear all of that. And yeah, like if that happened to me, what what a huge way to spend time learning to meditate and learning to really mm -hmm. like you're forced, right? You're mm -hmm. forced if you should choose that path to really deep dive. And then when you deep oh, yeah. dive, what are the tools I'm gonna use to make a difference? 
it's huge what you're talking about. And you mentioned, Sean, about uh, you started to look at codes and reading mm -hmm. things. What was that? Was that like, have you had a huge awakening and suddenly things started coming to you? Or did you have a connection with extraterrestrials or guides or fill in the blank? Yeah. So less in prison. So in prison, it was what I would consider this path that I started walking down to learn these things. Okay. Then one of the things that started to happen is, is I got really sick about three years after I got out and I developed Graves disease and thi thyroid condition. All of my life, I had never talked about the sexual abuse that happened, a lot of the trauma and the things that were going on in my life. Even I tried to take my life four times in my 20s, and I wouldn't talk about those things. So what I recognize is that every energetic center in your body, you think about the chakras of your body, right? They all hold a very specific frequency. If you're not actually expressing and talking about the things that are happening in your life or creating flow in any one of those centers, what ends up happening is they start to collapse on top of themselves. So no wonder we get cancer across the different chakras of our body, right? And so at which point I got the sickness and my thyroid got, you know, it, it became hyperthyroidism and Graves disease. And I just started getting sick all the time. Didn't understand it, went to quite a few doctors, they radiated it and it was completely gone. And so when I walked through that door of understanding that, like, hey, my body was holding this trauma, trauma and I didn't understand why at the time, it took me down a really rapid path to when I met my wife, my now wife and my girlfriend at the time. And, you know, she opened the door for me to feel comfortable to start talking about these things. So I started talking about my childhood sexual abuse because, you know, she had similar things in her life happen in her youth. I started talking about my depression and suicide attempts. I started talking about what happened to me in prison. I started opening up that vessel a lot more. And one of the things that happened, because it was right at the beginning of COVID, when all of this really started to um, mature itself, I that's this is when everything unlocked. And so what took place is as I started to speak that out, things started to show up in my life. You know, all of a sudden, you know, got into Sadhguru meditations. All of a sudden, Dr. Joe Dispenza stuff starts coming into my life. And I'm watching all these videos and going on these deep dives and knowing that there's some, knowing that there's something more besides the, you know, the biblical books that I've been reading, the dogma that I had been exposed to growing up. And so take that a little bit further down the line, down the line, I'm going to nine Dr. Joe retreats in a row. I'm meeting him. Um, all of this stuff starts to shift in my life. I end up on a walking meditation. This thing taps me on the head and I start to forgive, you know, the, the, the family member that had abused me sexually growing up. I started to forgive, you know, myself for trying to take my life. I forgave my you know, godfather for the things that he did and landed me in prison. And then I forgave just everything. And then I understood that it wasn't about the trauma that I had. It was about the abundance that I'm in right now. And then what shifted for me is I started to, at, at that, it was the, actually the first Dr. Joe retreat that I went to, I started to see all this code much differently. And what it was, was that every word that I was seeing had numerology around it or numbers around it. Like you could take a code and turn it into a number. I was seeing angel numbers everywhere. I was seeing, um, you know, how all of a sudden this stuff, like people were like talking talk to me about the I Ching and I could break that down and fit it into the hermetic principles. I was looking at the dimensions of creation and how those started to map out. I was taking astrology and breaking that down and I fit it into this thing that I call the codes of abundance. And now I can take any day of the week, read the code, take a frequency, a color associated with it and drop myself back into state of divine flow while also making sure that I'm taking whatever the emotion that I'm feeling, moving it into a divine energy. And then at which point it started to unlock things for me. And, you know, no matter what it is, whether it's your name, whether it's the conversation of the words that are coming out of my mouth, anything is very specific frequency for me and you to actually sit in co-creation with each other or anybody else that's hearing this. And there's no accident. So all of that started to create this different, um, this different knowing. It wasn't a thinking. It was just a knowing and as I opened that vessel of self and started to honor myself differently, everything started rushing in and it was, I was able to teach something much differently. And that's what I started to put out on my Instagram channel is just talking about that and putting that into the world, even wrote a book associated with it around these codes of abundance so that people could actually go through the process of figuring that out themselves. Can you give us what the code is for today in this very moment when you and I are speaking? Yeah. So we are on hump day or Wednesday. So that's a day of vibration. Okay. Um, within that, it depends on the emotion that you feel and how you lock into that. So every, every, it all depends on where you come from. So it, it kind of merges in differently based on the state that you're in. 
So it's not like a linear path. And that's one thing that in spirituality, we oftentimes get lost on. We're like, oh, it has to be A plus B equals C. There are entry points that you can get into at any given time. So let's say, for instance, I was feeling, um, you know, let's say grief. Okay. Um, and so I feel shame and grief. And then I take that feeling and I say, okay, the, the, the divine energy that I should be getting out of shame and grief is strength and love. Okay. That sits inside of this first dimensional framework, which is a dimension of integration. Okay. So I have this sitting inside of this first dimensional framework, which means that I have to, sorry, initiation, which means that I need to initiate something today, right. That sits in a balanced state. And because it's on a Wednesday, I need to focus on my vibration. I need to focus on my energy. All right. I'm not focused on my mind state. I'm not focused on, um, you know, the way that I'm actually sitting in my, in my sacral, I'm not focused on any of those things. I'm actually focused on my vibration and my heart. So I listen to my heart. I move into that state. And then at which point what I would do in that day, if I was off balance in any way, and I was feeling more shame and grief in that space is I would, I would actually focus on the color green. Right. And then I would also listen to 432 frequency. Okay. So I would take those frequencies, listen to them at the same time. And then I have a, we affirmation statement that, um, so one of the things that I did is a lot of people, what they do is they take I affirmation states as I am, I am, I am. It's a very selfish state to be. Nothing wrong with it. It's just a selfish state to be. I shifted that to start going from I to we. So if I take and say we are, what I'm doing is I'm also including the people outside of me, but every version of myself, mm -hmm. because we all constantly live in superposition, right? Mm -hmm. So there's infinite versions of me, the past, present, future version. There's the versions that never existed. There's the versions that, you know, could possibly come about if I started to honor them. But if I take that and I start using these statements of we, and then I shift my affirmation using that language, now I'm drawing all of those individuals in into the present moment. And I'm also taking in consideration everybody else in my life that I would ever be touching. And I'm no longer the I, I'm the we. And now I'm looking at it from a collective perspective instead of an individuation perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean... I don't know that we could wrap our head around it. I said, <laughs> people have to work with you because that's yeah. a lot. But I, I also deeply appreciate the lot that you, the content that you just gave us, because it's very valuable to position ourselves differently um, in how we interpret it. And actually, like I would have given very different descriptive words for how I'm feeling right now. And I love the fact that you did use grief because a lot of people post-election are going mm -hmm. through a very difficult time. So it was kind of perfect to hear you say that. Yeah. And so to take this idea, I'm going to, yeah, to take this idea that you're sharing right now, how can we uncover secrets for harmonious abundance? How can we unlock our full potential? What kind of tips around this can you share Richard? right yeah so i mean the thing of it is is that each of us each of us has created our own lives we are we are all the center point of our own universe right observing it out what i've recognized is that most people we all say like you know when you get in the spiritual community and when i first got involved in it it's like we're all 5d beings right we all like live in this five-dimensional space and you know that's not about the 3d and that's the 5D is the space of spirit, right? It's when you can integrate spirit, you move beyond righteousness, you move beyond judgment, you start to see things collectively, but then oftentimes we judge everybody because they're not there. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. And so what I ended up recognizing is that most of us, can, uh, we, we're not even 3D beings. We don't even understand the depth of ourselves. So if you take, and, and I'll kind of walk us through like some rituals of ways to get there, but you have to consider this first. Okay. When we only look at the, you know, you take the first three dimensions of space, which are height and width. All right. Everything that I touch, like I'll take this glass, for instance, when I touch, I'm sorry, you glass, said first three dimensions of space, height, width, and is there a third? Depth is the third one. Yeah. Okay. But we don't, most of us don't understand depth and I'll show you why here. Okay. I take this glass, for instance, this glass, when I touch the glass, I'm having a two dimensional experience of the glass. Even though it looks very three-dimensional, I can look inside of it. That's even my view of that glass inside of it is two-dimensional because I'm only looking at it. I don't know how many molecules of water there are in this. I have no concept. I have no idea the chemical makeup of this actual glass itself. And so take that and make yourself that glass. How many of us know how our heart's beating? 
How many of us know how much blood is moving through our body? How many of us know what we are really energetically feeling and what we're holding just if we take simple things like the chakras of our body, right? And the energy centers. How many of us know like what's going on in these different areas and are they in balance? Are they out of balance? How many of us know the depth of ourselves? Very few. And so for most of us, for us to even get to become a five-dimensional being and remove the righteousness, remove the judgment, see all good and evil as love, right? See everything as unified. We have to understand the depth of ourselves and why we created everything to love ourselves. So the first thing that I take people through immediately is, do you know you? And it's, we all say it's about self-love, but you know, the self-love oftentimes comes with a caveat that love has these conditions that are associated with what we've been taught love is, not with the divine created love to be. Okay. So the divine created love to be all things, but yet we've separated love from something else. And love sits over in this nice, pretty box that has a heart on it, that feels a very specific way that's been, you know, put on TV and everybody's like, that's love. And then we chase this thing and we separate all this other stuff. And no wonder these demons and dragons and darkness and shadows are jumping all over our back because they just want to be loved. Right. And so one of the things, and I'm not a huge proponent of religion, but what I do find is in the story of Yeshua in the 40 days and 40 nights, when he said, Satan, get behind me. It wasn't Satan, get away from him. It was Satan, get behind him so that he could actually lead the darkness into light. And so all of us, we oftentimes create this separation from this darkness. And we say, well, I don't want nothing to do with it, but we have to be the light that brings it into life. Right? So for any individual from a ritual perspective, you can do all of the meditations and chasing and all the different practices in the world. But if we don't have a depth of understanding of self, if we don't know that little mustard seed that's inside of us that has this light that created us from the inside, then we don't even, we don't even have a concept of how to become three-dimensional. And if that's the case, then we can never become four-dimensional, which is actually honoring time and being present because we're seeking something that we don't understand. And then, you know, damn the five-dimensional. <laughs> <laughs> because, because, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's just far away from us. And we don't even have the construct of the first three and the spatial understanding of self to be able to build from. And this is why the Trinity and the concept of all that's so important. All this code is there. It's like it's stuck in these different religious texts. And when you can start seeing it, you're like, oh, wow. Okay, wait a minute. I got to put it together. And mathematically, if you can fit it into these different constructs, it becomes a really beautiful thing. Yeah, I loved that. The little mustard seed. I love that. That's so true. And there's another, so I'm so not Bible, by the way. So, <laughs> so not knowledgeable because I didn't grow up with that. But yeah. the other thing I do like from that reference is about not hiding your light under a bushel. I mean, mm, yeah. we all came here at this really interesting time to be part yes. of the puzzle, to create a new earth and a new humanity. And these pieces you're talking about, this unlocking somebody so they can be all that their soul truly is and discover that journey and that beingness, this is super important. I, I really get what you're saying. And so cultivating this self-awareness through practical, time-efficient techniques, how can somebody new to this, what you are referring to and compelled by what you're saying, how can they start integrating this self-awareness into their daily practice or routine? Yeah. So I, I, what I do is pull together quantum physics and spirituality, right? And what people have to start doing, the first thing you have to do is find your center point. Okay. That's why we have this thing called prayer hands. What's your center point? How do you become still enough and find that point of center? And we've been given all the evidence of it. I mean, we have this whole zero point in time that happened at the concept of Christ's birth that they weren't counting down to zero, right? Why did that zero exist? And when we can start, this is why, this is why they say, okay, you need to do like Christ does. Now I'm not saying do that. What I'm saying is, is you have to, the code of that is how do you find the center point within self? Okay. The first practice that I take individuals through is that they have to do two things. The first one is that they have to understand all the patterns that they've been given, the negative self-love patterns, all the trauma, everything that they've held on to, that they've turned into the avatar of themselves and that they start to put out into life in order to perceivably keep themselves safe, successful, 
whatever it is that, you know, you are in life. And on the other side of it is you have to be able to unlock this code of abundance. Okay. And so the code of abundance is, is that anytime you get thrown out of state, you get an emotion, you feel a certain way, you are angry, whatever. All of that is not for you to stay angry. It is literally a remembrance opportunity for you to move into divine energy so that you can pull that in. And there are practices inside of this code of abundance framework, the book that I have, we'll be talking about um, at the Conscious Life Expo, all of, you know, everything that we're going to be doing, that in itself is how this unlocks. The other side of it is that if you, you can do this code of abundance thing, you can do all the crazy meditations, you can do anything you want to do, but if you still have those negative self-love patterns sitting inside of you and you haven't solved those, then you're still stuck, right? You're going to keep going back and reverting back to those different cycles. So an exercise that I take people through, and this actually bridges somewhat to the seven hermetic laws, which ties to the seven days of creation, the seven chakras of the body. This number seven is really magical, is that I have people write down seven things about their, they have to go through a little bit of a trauma exercise with their parents. But at the end of it, they write down the seven things that they absolutely love about their parents. They write down the seven things that they just don't love about their parents, right? The seven things that they detest and feel like they're stuck in. I have them rip the paper in half, okay? And then I have them catch this one on fire. Now there's some stuff they do a little bit before this around like writing letters and stuff that they work through, but they, they catch this one on fire and they burn it and they watch it burn because it no longer belongs to them. And then they take these seven and then they map these seven to the seven hermetic laws, the seven laws of you, the seven laws of the universe. Okay. And then they form this thing and I have it on my arm. I don't know if you can see it. Okay. This philosopher's stone. Okay. So the philosopher's stone is triangle, circle, square, all combined. It looks like the thing on Harry Potter. And they map it to this philosopher's stone and that becomes their code that they walk through in life. It's like if I were Iron Man and I put this thing on my chest, I have this like, I have my own power symbol. I know these seven things that I received from this parent, these parents that created me that I absolutely love. And I'm going to expand that and that's going to be my life. And I walk in life with that. And I map these to these hermetic laws and the laws of the universe that I have not ever been able to get around. They literally sit in every ancient religious text. There's inside of the Emerald Tablets. They're in everything. So now I can use that as code in order to create my life. And now all of a sudden, I walk as this abundant being, as a divine creator in human form. And now I'm just magnifying light all the time. And I'm not holding on to the negative self-love patterns and the trauma. And that's how I start to crack this code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's magnificent. And I think what you said is really important because no matter where you come from, even the most detestable conditions, yep. there always exists, there has to exist some modicum of light. I come yeah. from a, an exceptionally traumatic background um, and parental situation. And I'm highly aware, somebody once helped me, I'll tell you how that came about, but somebody once helped me uh, with my dad in particular. And he said, um, like, at least was your dad good looking? Did you get the genes? And I'm like, yeah, he really was a great looking guy. And then yeah. you start thinking, oh, and he spoke five languages. Oh, mm -hmm. and he climbed mountains. Like he was a, he's always been an athletic guy who did marathons. Oh, and he traveled the world. Oh, okay. So these are very worldly things that I love occupying. Also camping, like no one yeah. else in my family did, but dad. And even though dad wasn't in my life much, if at all, I got that, right? That's yeah. in my genetic makeup. And same with my mother, highly intelligent, very political, cared about all people, was about the most, um, I guess you call it colorblind, like didn't see color or gender mm -hmm. choices. or And she was way ahead of a time, did yoga when nobody was doing stuff like that. But, you know, so that column you're talking about burning and releasing so huge. I was just having a conversation with a with a family member today about another family member who is caught in the cycle, resisted, hated a lot of things about the people who raised him, but he is blind to the fact that he is enacting them. But we can see mm. it. We can see this mm -hmm. projection, this shadow work living in him. And so you're talking about like if he or someone like him or anyone listening could take that piece burn it, release it, uh, doesn't ancestrally have to be passed down, but then honor these at least seven beautiful things that you were gifted with in your soul chose really yeah. in this life and that you can walk with that 
you know, with pride that I get to have these beautiful things. And then I'm assuming, asking you, we can add in our unique aspects of what our soul can do and our parents and their parents, maybe we're not equipped with. So then we add our own flavor flavor to the soup. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and you can, what'll happen is, is that what I always say is that that piece, because what we do is we validate our trauma based on our parental upbringing. Okay. So then we're like, oh, well, my, it was my parents. It had to be okay. No matter what it was, it's like you create this rational cycle. So when you have this new code based on your parental upbringing, that's only about abundance and love. Then of course, when you add anything onto it, you become a creator of it because you're not stuck in the cycle anymore. Okay. So then once that starts to happen, you start to become this, this channel, this, this divine, you, you are literally a fifth dimensional being at that point, because you're no longer looking at right and wrong. You've let the thing that's perceivably wrong go, and you've made a choice to release it. And now everything that you see is nothing but love and abundance. It's nothing but wholeness. And even if something negative comes is what will happen. A family member will remind you of that version of you. Somebody will be like, you know, somebody you're, you're in a relationship with will be like, oh, no, this is what you used to be. So let me hold you accountable to that. And when you can stand in truth of that as the new version of you, all of a sudden, the mirror that you show to them, it's really them that had to create that version of you to have that karmic release so that they could become free. So now you become a mirror for everybody for them to see themselves based on the purity of self. And you're no longer becoming this like thing that's trying to manipulate the code outside of you, given the fact that like you don't even know yourself because you're stuck in these other patterns that have been passed down generationally. Right. And while you're doing that, like I'm listening to you and I know you've got to have your lineage energetically around you when you do work at that level saying, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for breaking this so it doesn't have to keep being out in the world, this dysfunctional piece. And thank yeah. you for shining the light that we gifted you with. Yeah, 100%. I mean, the one of the most beautiful experiments that I studied was this delayed choice quantum eraser by a guy named Robert Wheeler. It was in 2007. And the, the, the study was he took some photons, he shot them through a splitter, he had these different tools observing them. It's kind of similar to the double slit experiment. But then he started measuring them at different times. And what would happen is based on the time that he was measuring it, it would change the trajectory of the past photon where it was going. So essentially how you observe things now from the perspective of where you are will change the actual energy of the past. And they've proven this scientifically. <laughs> Okay, so so now all like the people that are like, oh, like you can't change your past. So you can change your past. So the thing you're talking about with my lineage, and if it's just my lineage, our lineage, because we're all interconnected, the minute that one person starts to make that choice, it changes everything for everybody. And where we get lost is when that one person starts to make a decision to adjust themselves based on the way that they're being challenged in the world. So if I said, if you said to me right now, like, I don't believe anything you're saying. And I'm like, you know what? I question myself and I hesitate. I break everything. I now fall. My whole thing falls apart. And then everything goes back into chaos in my collective observation. Now I can reset that over and over again, but it's that this is the thing where, you know, if you, you know, once again, using a little bit of Bible story as an example of where, you know, somebody who was able to perform wild miracles, walk on water, throw fish into a boat, raise the dead, do all this other stuff, made a decision to sit on a cross when they didn't have to. Could have manipulated all the space and time and do all this other stuff, made a decision to get betrayed, made a decision to actually go in front of all these individuals because it was not going to make the adjustment of itself to fall victim to that which being challenged in order to save itself. It was there to save everybody else reflected out. And that's just, you, you know, that's just like the energetic makeup of it. And we all have that capability inside of us as the collective that can come around and save humanity collectively. We, none of us can do it individually. Mm -hmm. Can we take, can we take, I think this is an emotion. No, it's a feeling or an experience. Overwhelm. So I'd love to hear some practical ways to bring a sense of spirituality and purpose. And so I'll, I'll give you a really specific example of, you know, if that helps you to run with this. I am feeling that a lot right now. I, I'm very blessed. 
And I really know it. I'm very blessed. And there's so much happening for me at this point, this juncture. Why now? Oh, I don't know. Scooby-Doo. I don't know. But I know that is my life experience. And I know it is the abundance continues, continues. Now with that abundance is attached to that to do's, to do's, to do's, to do's, to do's. And everybody, every time I think, oh, a human couldn't take on any more, even more comes and attached to it is even more things to accomplish in order to have that happen. So there's a definite experience of overwhelm. And I, I might even say a little disconnect from having fun. Like I love to have fun. I love to laugh. I love, there's so much beautiful things to do. And I even want the capacity, Sean, if you call me and said, Deb, let's hang out that I, I'm like, yeah, let's, let's look at when, and it's an easy, there's enough space to do that. So I'm not fully in that picture. So what would you do for the folks who are listening, who are having this experience of overwhelm and a bit of disconnect? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So what's interesting about overwhelm is that whenever you get into the space of receivership, okay, because what will happen is, is imagine that the divine is just like bombarding you with energy over and over again, right? You're like, what you just talked about, this happens to me. And I'm like, am I going to be grateful, one, to receive all of this? And for a lot of individuals, whenever we are don't have strength inside of our femininity, and what I mean by that is if you receive? if you study the huh, you mean to receive in the to receive, yeah. So in the Kabbalah, right, you have the tree of life. Okay, on the masculine side of it, you have wisdom. Okay, well, actually, that's the right side. You have wisdom, you have love, and you have victory. Okay, these are the three spirit that are on the masculine side. On the feminine side, it's about understanding, which is understanding and receiving what's happening in the future. Okay, it's being able to then become strong. So strength then sits at that middle spirit inside of it. And then at the bottom of this, it's empathy. Okay, so as my, my feminine qualities that are all encompassed in every human being, if you take and map the tree of life down into your body itself, my left side or my feminine side, okay, literally has to have an aspect of understanding or intuition. Okay. So if my intuition is off and I'm not able to pull through, let's say for instance, my third eye isn't, isn't centered and I'm not able to actually get in balance. If I'm not using my voice, okay. In order to talk about what I'm looking to put out in life and I'm blocking like this upper aspect of the feminine chakras of my body. Okay. Then it would what's going to take place on the left side of me and i'm getting a little bit spiritual in this and i'm going to ground it here in a second right. then my intuition is an imbalance so my intuition is an imbalance then what's supporting that is my strength that sits underneath this in order to receive so imagine you know imagine you've got this big vessel it's a, i'm going to take a v-shaped cup and it's made out of paper and i dump a lot of water into it eventually that cup's going to break mm -hmm. if i've got a metal cup or a glass cup that's that same way well i can hold a lot and the more that I actually am in my intuition, the more I can expand my vessel because I know it's coming and I'm no longer living in fear to contract my vessel. Okay. So my vessel will expand, which means that when I start receiving like all of this crazy stuff in my life, I'm able to hold it because I'm now strong enough, given the fact that I know it's coming and I built the container to be able to hold whatever is there. And then underneath that, I have to have empathy all the time. And I used to call BS on empathy because I would say, why do I want to take on anybody else's trauma? And I know we were talking about like, you know, you go to these spaces and earlier, like you go to these spaces and energy, like is a lot. So like, I don't want to receive that. But once you develop the ability to become an alchemist of your empathy and you take it in and you can constantly move it through life and whatever comes into you, no matter what it is, you don't have any righteousness or judgment associated with it. You're strong enough to receive everything that's there you see it all with nothing but gratitude. Wow. Okay. Wow. And you're like, oh, well, this is a beautiful thing. Life becomes a game because you created the game to be played. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you're like, you're like, well, I created this. Why am I going to be mad at it? I'm going to be overwhelmed, but like, it's me actually doing this thing. I can actually hold the receivership around it. And just because I've been taught that this is a lot, mm -hmm. that's the empathy that needs to be recycled into abundance. I need to create the alchemy of that empathy. Okay. So people have told me, oh, like people say, Sean, you run like four companies. That's a lot. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. Right. And I have fun doing it. It's a game that I play with myself because I know exactly what's coming because I'm in my divine feminine. And I've got an amazing wife that reminds me how to be that way. Okay. 
And then at which point I can hold that vessel in strength. And so it just keeps getting stronger and I keep widening it. And the widening it is all those people that, that these minions and these people that come behind me and make it bigger. And we hold it together because they're not afraid either because they know where I'm going is the truth. But it's a we thing. It's never a me thing. Does that make sense? Whoa. Well, that whole thing about empathy, gratitude for everything and everyone being able to alchemize it, like that's that's really deep, actually, um, to be with. We would be in a completely different planet, no less I'm also filtering this through me right now, and I would be in a different human experience. That, talk a little bit more about that, because I really find that fascinating. The, the empathy and the um and the receivership or yeah, and of the alchemization of it and if you want use a personal example maybe of a or of a client of a trial that they faced and how they were able to hold all of it uh, receive mm -hmm. all of it and alchemize all of it yeah I'll use I'll use me for instance so you know and I'm, I'm gonna get I'll get a little um out there with it not out there with it but this is the know. right audience by the way they live here so you're well, i'm gonna i'm gonna get to vulnerable vulnerable all right. all right so about three years ago i did my first ayahuasca journey right on. okay and went down that path and became a total spiritual asshole i was out there judging everybody <laughs> I'm like, you don't know this stuff, you know and I'm, i have this crazy download and i'm like oh i know all these things at that moment in time my fiance, well, girl, boyfriend, girlfriend at the time, we broke up. And because I didn't feel like we were on the same path, right? And then I went out on my own and, you know, started a little mini cult in LA and became an asshole and, you know, just like went off on this thing. People who like me, you got to like me and like the things that I say. Otherwise, you don't belong. Judgment, the whole thing. If you take the right side of the tree of life, right? And this whole Kabbalah, the victory wasn't there. I wasn't winning for all. I was winning for a few. So I was hurting a lot of individuals. Victory and empathy are direct lines to each other. So when this happens, I can no longer be empathetic because I can't take in the energy of anybody in order to create the victory for all. Okay. So then at which point, if this is not connected, okay, then I'm creating a lot of pushback. I went through me chasing, you know, all the different things um, in the LA scene and um, ended up, you know, ended up very alone when it all was said and done. And I was miserable. And I didn't, then I did an Iboga journey, <laughs> which grounded the shit out of me. Oh, okay. okay. That's so I did. Yeah. Did that. Saw all of my negative self-love patterns, saw everything. And it was all the vision that I kept getting with Sophia, which is my now wife was just in my vision over and over and over and over and over again. And I'm like, okay, this means something. I didn't know what it meant. So I ended up taking that, going and doing the Hoffman process a few months later. And that helped me map everything across these negative self-love patterns. And I'm like, oh, now I get it. What ended up happening after that was the fact that when I'm going I'm to get to what, we, what we're talking about here, was that I was, I had, I had no concept of what feminine energy looked like. I had no concept of what empathy looked like. I would tell people, don't be empathetic, be compassionate, and don't take on the energy of anybody. And once I started taking on the energy of Sophia in my life, because I had treated her like shit during that year, I was manipulative. I was like the spiritual vampire. I was taking what I needed, what I wanted it. And I was just like a really, I would say like a, a no judgment, but a kind of nasty three-dimensionally as far as it related to her and a lot of other people in my life, you know, and me just wanting to show up as this person that people needed to see instead of who I really was. And so once I was able to really become empathetic on her energy and take everything that she was feeling in, like really take it in, feel it, like know her, like, because I knew myself because I created that experience of her. I got really sick. I went through it all, but then I was able to say, okay, this piece that I feel of her, right? When she's angry or frustrated or feels scared or, you know, jealous of another woman or any of these things, because it wasn't the jealousy of another woman. It was how I was showing up that was creating it. Okay. She's a very secure person. But when I go with my sacral open and I'm sitting there acting like with leaky energy flowing around because I want some this affirmation, it can only make her feel a certain way. 
So I have to take all of that in and then I have to be able to turn it into something else. And then that's what I give back out. That's that masculine side that says, okay, now I actually have wisdom off of what I've learned. I'm now taking this in from a, from a vessel perspective. I'm empath. I'm becoming wildly empathetic with it. And I'm turning what you feel into loving abundance. And now the words that come into my mouth, don't hesitate. They're very precise. I give I, I my actions, even though if you, I get challenged from her every now and then where it's like, hey, are you really going to be this way? Like we went to this beautiful experience called Ondalenda this past weekend where it was down in Creus, Mexico. And, you know, and people are out there like half dressed and, you know, having a good time. But can I be with her and make her feel like she is the queen of this world every moment? And like, I'm not my head's on a swivel. Like she is the only person that I'm paying attention to and that everybody around me knows that. And that's alchemy because I'm taking all these experiences. I'm empathizing everything she's ever felt, felt. I'm now showing up as a superhero and just pushing it out into the world in such a beautiful way. And she feels that and everybody around me feels that. Everybody around me is like, oh, that's his wife. And, you know, then they're they're coming to her asking her like, like about life and everything along those ends because it's us, right? And we've built that covenant of a container that is such a magnification of love because we've gone through it. And that empathy allowed me to feel something deeply that I've never felt before that most individuals that spiritually bypass and run away from. Mm. I think, you know, the overarching theme of why you are who you are, Sean, you've never been afraid to roll up your sleeves and go deep and really grow, like really look at stuff things that weren't working, things were, were not creating. And I love that about you. I love that hunger to say, this is not okay, or this is not enough, or this is not working. What's What am I bringing to the party? Yeah. And then really taking an honest look and then, okay, there is all that. Then what do I do with all that? And finding, navigating your way through I'm sure the journey, it's not like this when you describe it, it's a process. Um, yeah. and I, God, you're so brave. <laughs> so I've done a lot of ayahuasca and a few other things. I'm highly aware. The one thing I've never done is the iboga because the whole idea, <laughs> 32 <laughs> hours of laying there and not being able to move because of nausea. Yeah. And I mean, I can't wrap my head around it, but I do understand it's an incredibly life altering experience, especially for addicts and alcoholics, yeah. like the way to change and Huffman process been there, done that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, and, and think about what we're addicted to, you know, that's, that's the thing that, that I Boga was like, Hey, just like, you know, just shakes you up. Mm. <laughs> I didn't know what it meant at the time, but it shook me up so much. And I'm, like, I'm, a, I'm addicted to affirmation. Mm. I'm addicted to the illusion in the world telling me that I need to be a specific way. I'm addicted to, you know, um, this like sacral, like, I mean, in my human design, my sacral is completely open, right? I'm addicted to having that build, right? I was addicted to all these things. And then at which point I have the ability to fill it myself. So I broke all those addictions, but it was breaking them so that I could understand how to help us, how to help we, and then my life's purpose you know, is to truly help us understand why we create everything in our life to love ourselves. And then at which point we become fully abundant. And all of this stuff that we talk about, it, it, it's, it's so wild. You know, you take the first, any, any book of religion, the first book of Genesis or any of those, it's seven days. It's, everything is in this whole code of seven. And so it literally sits inside of this. And then once you can understand that and you go a little bit deeper and you can go on a mile long journey. I mean, I've studied too many things. I guess there's never too many, but I've studied a lot of stuff. It all works together. Every single thing mm. is connected. Like we think, oh, I Ching is this, and then this is that. No, it's like literally connected. Astrology connects to, you know, all of these religions. And we're like, oh, it has to create this separation. But when you can find the center point, then we walk as this, we reunite the Tower of Babel. We're no longer speaking a different language. There's a verbal way of conscious communication that will move beyond the way that we talk. And we start to elevate ourselves. I truly, my knowing is that this extraterrestrial stuff that we're seeing and that's showing up is evolved versions of us that are here to remind us of what we are so that we can stop the suffering. 
and they'll show up more and more as we start this ascension and we'll collectively do it together. And this is where that second coming comes from. It's all of us doing it. And we start snapping into a different frequency. And that's when we truly become these 5D beings and walking in our purpose. Beautiful. So beautifully said. Uh, absolutely. Yes. And if that isn't reason to go into your heart and to live, uh, you know, cleaning up the act, I don't know what is. And to hear you reframe for me, certainly, and I hope for a lot of people, because I had the word addiction in a box, right? What mm. did that look like? And there are aspects of it I can't relate to, but you just took it out of like drug, alcohol, like gambling and all that, but put it into the patterns we're reenacting over and over again. I mean, in, in um, you know, the AA programs, they call it insanity, doing the same thing over and over which is something we've all heard, but you're reframing this idea of why you allowed yourself to go through these massive growth experiences because you were addicted to affirmation. And what is someone out there listening or watching us right now addicted to? And I think that's so powerful. No one wants to think of themselves as being an addict. Once upon a time, I used to smoke cigarettes. Mm. I smoked, I started, I a long time. I started when I was sixth grade. It was insane because everybody would look at me like I'm so healthy and like be shocked at the shame. I felt shame when someone caught me with a cigarette. And one day I thought, oh my God, this is who I become. You could put that cigarette on a chair and I will genuflect to it because it mm. rules me. It controls me. I've mm -hmm. got to have it. Mm -hmm. And that aspect made me so disgusted that I would give my power to an inanimate object like that. And that's when I'm like, all right, I don't care. Now it's been like two decades. So yeah, it's not even a thing. It doesn't even exist, but it, it sure existed then. And the disgust over what I had done to empower something over myself like that, that's what led me on whatever it takes. I know I need to figure out a way done with this in my life. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and I went on that journey. Um, yeah. This is so beautiful. What is the biggest barrier, Sean? Because you work with people, you talk to people. What do you see is the one thing prevalent that, that like people are trying to tap into their own power, but there is this block to their strength inside of themselves, like showing up, pushing these things out, healing these things. What is the biggest barrier you see over and over with people? It's the, it's the paradox of individuation. So we, in order to know ourselves, we have to go deep. So we have to become individuals, right? But then we're connected to everything. And so being able to and and that's, and we have it backward. What we have to, we think is like, Oh, I'm Sean, I'm separate from everybody. And so I need to understand, like, like my father, for instance, he's like one of the most studious persons I've ever met. He's got five degrees. He's studied everything. And he's looking at, okay, what books can I get into and all these things? But his understanding of self is so light. Okay. And so if he said, let me, how do I study me? What is the Akashic records, the book of myself? How deep can I go within? How can I sit in that space and know myself? Then what ends up happening is that you know, the books that show up, show up when they need to. The people that show up, show up exactly based on what Don Hoffman calls is the fitness of yourself. You start to move yourself into this beautiful, beautiful space of fitness, right? And then at which point everything becomes perfectly aligned because you're no longer disconnected. So for individuals that are lost in that paradox, this whole illusion that we're in, it's perfectly built for our awakening to remember ourselves. And if we stay focused on what's outside of us for the answers, we will stay continually lost because you can't get the answer outside of you. Okay. And that's what I see people mostly involved with. They're like, oh, what, what do I, what book do I read next? What thing do I need to do next? Well, I'm, there's no guru more than the guru of yourself. Mm. Okay. And so for each person, when they end up saying, okay, I want to follow and seek the things that you're saying, okay, this is temporary. Because I got lost in a bunch of people. I got lost in Sadhguru land and Dr. Joe land and everybody else. And I was in it and doing the thing over and over again, right? And that's great, right? But to a point. But then I have to remember that it's here. And 
that's the hardest part because the sensory perceptions that we have are so real. They feel more real than what's inside of us. And when we flip that script and know what's inside of us is more real than what we sense, it's game over. What a timely conversation this is. It really is. I feel like for what is going on in the planet, for what is going on in this country, for where people are at a disconnect, I really appreciate you bringing this kind of value right now. I really see oh, you and I appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And so folks are like, I want me some more of Sean Clayton. <laughs> <laughs> they have an opportunity coming up. Yes. At the LA Conscious Life Expo specifically, folks, it is February 7th through the 10th. Uh, LAX Hilton, which is an unbelievable hotel. We take take over all three floors. And what are you speaking about at the Conscious Life Expo? I think you've got three different times you're talking. So yummy. Tell us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one is going to be on this code of the Messiah, non-religious, but it's actually the code of the center point of creation so that you can create from the inside out. So kind of the things we're talking about here and how this lives from a connection of science and spirituality and the proof points that if you need those proof points, we'll be able to show every single one of them so that you can find your way back inside of yourself, right? It's like, hey, here's all the doors. Now go back in the door with them. So there's that one. Um, I'm also going to be teaching around the codes of abundance, that structure that I was talking about. Um, I have a book and an app to go along with it, but you'll be able to understand how all of this grids together. And it's taking every ancient thing, every sacred principle, all the stuff that all of us do on a daily basis and understand how to execute that. Okay. Um, and you know, I, I believe the other one is around like how to release trauma, um, if I'm not mistaken. So those are the, those are the three things we'll be talking about. Fantastic. And so the link to buy is in the notes. And if you like it right now and why not sign up and get your tickets, definitely, uh, book this. It's so worth it. It's a entire weekend of your own community, your own tribe, connections, fantastic food, beautiful how they, 23 years they've been doing this, so they're pretty darn good at it. You can see who they attract through Sean Clayton. You can go to debbie-shinger.com slash C-L-E. That's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash C-L-E to get your tickets now, find out more. And uh, your website, Sean, is scienceofabundance.a. I, and I just want to ask, would you direct people any place in particular, aside from that, to find out more about you or work with you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if they go to my Instagram, um, Abundance10,000 is my Instagram. So it's 10000. Um, I also have YouTube um, that I'm putting more long form on there. But any one of those places is a way to reach me. Um, we have courses that come out every quarter. Uh, where individuals drop in and we teach this, what I call the the science of you and the codes of abundance and all of this so that individuals can remember who they really are. And, you know, we just, we just, we just go for it. So it's, it's a beautiful thing. The, the purpose of it is for us all to understand that we're all superheroes. We're all creators. We're all divine. And, you know, there is no guru bigger than you. Mm. Well, this is dare to dream, Sean. So what do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Oh, mine is just be present, be present in love and us to remember this collective ascension that we're on. I, 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 I know there are no accidents. I know that this way, this country is right now is, is challenging, but it's a beautiful opportunity for us to come together. And um, I feel like by the year 2030, we will figure this out. So I'm excited to see that all come together and um, honored just to be here, to be able to speak with you. And, you know, this is right now is the most beautiful moment of my life because I'm in it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming on the show and for sharing yes. at that level. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate you. And I end today's show with this quote from Alan Cohen. Abundance is not a number or acquisition. It's the simple recognition of enoughness. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation. Please go ahead, click like, and let us know how you're feeling, what your takeaway was in the comments. I do read them all. And the subscription, it's essential, folks. This is coming out 
for free for over 17 years to you. I know it changes lives because I hear from you guys, but remember, you actually help me. It's a gift back to me and it's a gift to the planet right now. There are so many people looking to find this information. So I thank you in advance for sharing this with people who need to hear it. Another reason to subscribe, look who's coming on the show in the next weeks. There's going to be Suzanne Giesman, Teal Swan, Daryl Anka, who channels Bashar, Rebecca Dawson, Thomas Winterton, Marie Diamond, Paul Hynek, and Barbara Lamb. Thanks for joining us. And find out what addictions you have, what behaviors are not working for you and that you'd like to end today Go inside deeply and know that you have all the answers, as Sean said, inside. So grateful that you joined us today.